Let me remind you that uh, I'm calling the sermon this morning and the sermon this afternoon a prelude to addressing more directly persecution that may be showing up and certainly could be worse before some of you at least leave this world. This morning, the cost of discipleship was emphasized that to be a faithful servant of God in the Lord's church, to be a Christian, demands a willingness to say all else is secondary and subsidiary to the interest of our Lord and that we must love Him supremely and that we should never be a part of the world to the point to where He's put in second place. That if we so do, we will be persecuted. That doesn't mean we're going to be burned at the stake today or fed to lions tomorrow. There's all sorts of ways of being persecuted. And things can happen in this country that has never happened before in the way of persecution by the government. So we want to address some of those things later on, but I'm trying to lay foundation work because in the beginning of things, as far as Christ and the church is concerned, as we saw this morning, he did all he could do. And we may say because it was the Lord, the master teacher, all that needed to be done to give us the wherewithal to be fortified and to know what to expect when we love the Lord and keep his commandments and will not be turned away from it. And that is, as Paul said to Timothy, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So our minds must be made up. We must see it. We must realize it all goes along with the territory. There is a cross for us to bear daily, and that means that we're willing to be sacrificing anything in order to be obedient to the Lord. Now, when you look back at the Lord's own work in His earthly ministry, and then when you see the church, the spiritual body of Christ, established in Acts 2, as Luke records by inspiration. But then you read throughout the book of Acts, the first beginnings of the spread of the gospel. It wasn't long before there was persecution. But something brought on that persecution. What was it? It was the message that was preached, the gospel message. But who preached it? Well, it was the church. The church is expected of God to do that. We're obligated to do that. To the best of your ability, wherever you are, you're obligated to set a godly example and to teach the truth and to show people the way of righteousness. But on the other hand, the Bible's very clear that the world hated Jesus, and Jesus said, if it hated me, it will hate you. So there's much in the New Testament that says expect it, as we talked about this morning. It's all part and parcel to the devil going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And that never stops. And we must be fortified against it. But what made that happen? Because the church was a militant church, not with actual swords or anything like that, but it was militant against evil. One of the things I would like to remind everybody about that's a danger to all of us, and I'll say more about it when we get more specifically in other sermons, the Lord willing, into this business of dealing with persecution. I don't know what it is, but when members of the church many times are challenged and even ridiculed and mocked, made light of, but especially challenged for what we believe, that is, what the Bible teaches is necessary to salvation, obligatory, the truth of God's Word, we many times sort of back up and go on the defensive. Well, I know that we're to be ready to give an answer to every man that asks us the reason that's within us with meekness and fear. An answer there is apologia, and it means to make a defense, to give the reason why we believe what we believe. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about we sort of say, well, you know what? didn't mean to offend you type. We may not say that, but we sort of start backing up. When we ought to be going forward, if you will look at the Apostle Paul, when people went after him, he was right back with them. 
He looked at every opposition to him for preaching the gospel as an opportunity to go right back at him. And we mentioned this this morning when Paul was charged with doing unlawful things and he was brought before Felix, Festus, and Agrippa to make his defense. And he made it clear, I'm not, I ha I'm not guilty of what they charged me with. But he immediately turned it around and laid it out as to what was necessary without apology. We must have that attitude. The Lord's church and all that the New Testament says concerning the Lord's church and Christians individual being the light of the world and the salt of the earth must understand that you don't let people run over you. Now, I don't mean we slap them in the face, beat them over the head, the club, and all that kind of thing. But there's a lot of things I can do with my mouth I can't do with my fist. And if you read the book of Acts, you'll see how it works. And if you read Jesus' and his earthly ministry, you'll see how it works. We're expected to say things to people when they say something back to us. Somebody says something to me that's derogatory, then he might as well expect me saying something back to him in defense of what I'm doing since he's criticizing me for it. And I fully intended a long time ago that when somebody started in like that, I was going to set them back on their heels. And that might make them think twice about several things. But so many times we say, well, no, I, I, I didn't do this, I didn't that. But the Lord's church in the first century was aggressive and militant. And I don't mean, again, a carnal warfare. I mean it had a charge from God to do these things, to be what God chose the church to be in sounding out the gospel and defending the faith. And they recognize if we don't do it, who's going to do it? The word militant means engaged in warfare. Fighting aggressively, active, combative. And yet I've grown up in a time when a great many people in the church thought, well, you're wrong if you expose error. You're wrong if somebody criticizes you unjustly and criticizes you because you teach the truth that you should just kind of bow out. I've, I guess the greatest persecution I've ever felt to this day has not come from anybody except members of the church. We need bunch. I don't know how they read the book of Acts with a clear conscience, except they see in it what they want to see in it and tune out everything else. So why does persecution come, and why did it come upon Christ? Why did it come upon the apostles? Because they were aggressive with the truth. I don't mean rioters and burners of buildings and all the kind of stuff we see and that kind of thing. It's Christ's army that we are. We'll sing it with the kids. I'm in the Lord's army. What are we trying to teach them? No, we are expected to be good soldiers of the cross. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus. Look at what we have in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 17. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, the devil wasn't just going to appear in his own evil person. The devil's going to work through his agents. That's who they had to stand against. And read the book of Acts. And you will see the wicked people that persecuted them and how they dealt with them. Notice, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You don't have to go out of your neighborhood to find that. It's right there. People who live contrary to the truth of God, who are ignorant of it, who enjoy the lust of the flesh, thus the eyes of pride of life. And then there are others who just don't know. They're coming up second or third generation without being exposed to much of anything pertaining to God, Christ, and the Bible, denominational or otherwise. But if you're going to be able to do this, then you're going to have to do what the Holy Spirit said. And he said, 
Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand, to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand. Therefore, the light of what I just said, having your loins girt about with truth, there's no substitute for knowing the truth of God's Word, and there's no way to know it but study. And there's no way you're going to study it unless you hunger and thirst after it as if it's your natural food you need to sustain your body. Having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, Take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I'd say that covers persecution, wouldn't you? And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Then he goes ahead and say, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Notice how Paul personally includes himself in this. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now let me ask you something. Would that be a good prayer for you to pray and for me to pray all the time? That when it comes time to stand up for the master and whatever it may be, that we're praying this kind of prayer that we'll be able to do it. So if we're going to be able to handle whatever way persecution comes upon us because we love and obey the truth, we've got to first of all expect it as we study this morning. Know it's part and parcel to being a godly person. Next of all, we've got to realize that the Lord's church is not a namby-pamby, wet spaghetti noodle thing. It's strong. Listen to the strength that's in what we just said. And, of course, Paul would say to Timothy very plainly that he's charged before God to preach the Word. I'm sorry that there are people who call themselves preachers, and I've seen a number of them, and they're certainly out there today, who don't really feel like there's, there's, their, heart, their heart's just not in it. That's what it comes down to. Yet Paul said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap of themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. It's amazing that right after that, look what he says. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. What's your hope, Paul? Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. Does that sound like they live lives that were just so, well, I'll get around to it someday. Don't disturb so-and-so. Let's not upset the idolatrous people. Let's not uh, oppose folks who want to think there's more than one God. Remember, it's in this same Ephesian letter in chapter 4 that in a world that believed in all kinds of gods and every kind of immorality and incorporated that in with religion, that he says there is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Don't tell me denominationalism is acceptable because you feel right. It's high time that the Lord's church and all that that means in the New Testament, when they're dealing with 
members of your own family, your friends or whatever that are religious, to say, how do you know you're right? I had a fellow call me yesterday. He's 93 years old. He said he was talking to his nephew who was 70-something years. I think he said he's my age, 77. And he said his nephew was telling him how that uh, he and others of this church, that church, and some other church, they all got together at different ones' churches and at their different houses, and they just all had a big time together. And he says, I asked him, I said, what kind of Bible do you have? He said, well, I just use the King James Version. He said, where in the King James Version did you ever read of anything about Christians doing what you just described to me? Well, he said, he got upset at him. Said, we spent a long time, said, we finished our phone conversation and being very upset with me. You know what? We don't like folks upset with us. That's where the problem is. We don't like folks upset with us. We had really rather say, go on to hell and burn eternally than me upset you. Now, I know we might not explicitly in just so many words as I just did say that, but if you don't watch out, that's what we do. <laughs> We need to be confrontive. Now, see, confrontive and combative are those things that sounds like you're just itching for a fight. Well, it might surprise you if you read Restoration literature when the brethren knew more about those things and had more zeal and more faith and more concern to follow what we just read here. But the denominations round about said, well, if you're a follower of that man Campbell, you're just looking for a dispute, meaning a dispute. Well, why would they do that? Because they cared. They cared about people who were in error. We don't think that way today. I listened to a fellow yesterday who was trying to explain why we're running out of preachers in the churches of Christ. He had some pretty good ideas. But then he had one that I thought was just uh, out the window. The reason, and I think it's fundamental and more the foundation of the reason than any other. People don't care about truth anymore. And they're not convicted. And they just soon let you go butt up a stump other than try to stop you from doing it. Because this business of, well, he's sincere. He's nice, you know. Just wrap your arm around him and give him a big hug. And he'll go to heaven. Now, you can say what you want to, but that's permeating the church as Christ has for the last 50-something years. And now it's in second and third generation. So no wonder we have to warn one another and it's a surprise to some people that, the, that Christians can be persecuted. Certainly if they're like Paul, they're going to be persecuted. Can you conceive of Paul not being persecuted in what you read about him, what he did, what he said? Even in the church, he said he had been in perils of false brethren. And then on top of being in perils of false brethren and perils of a lot of other things, Notice the great concerns brought upon him because he was a Christian, an apostle of Christ, an evangelist. And that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. You see, if he wasn't a Christian, he wouldn't have that care. He wouldn't, that'd be somebody else. Let George do it. <laughs> it's not my business. So the Lord's church was, was an army that came into this world to change this world. Remember? The worldly people said they turned the world upside down. In reality, they were turning it right side up as God would have it through the gospel when they changed people. So we must not allow the advocates of error any kind of free course. The church is to be aggressively involved in this fight. And it is a fight. And yet I fear greatly that a great many people are dodging persecution because they think if I cause a fight by teaching the truth to somebody, then I'm at fault. Well, let me ask you this. Was Christ at fault for being crucified? No, it was because he was perfect and sinless that he was crucified. The devil saw to that, that he was crucified. The church of the first century faced a largely indifferent society to religion, it's just whatever you think. It's hard for us. I, I imagine, I know I can't uh, realize what it'd be like to be in a world where most everybody is 
amoral, immoral, and it was all attached to worshiping all these false gods. They have no concept of the Old Testament. They don't know about the Bible. And the New Testament's not even fully revealed. It's just being so. And all these people have lived for years and years, generation after generation, like that. They thought nothing of it. And then somebody comes along and says, there is one God. Remember Paul of Mars Hill? He, he looked at all these different idols and altars, and it says his spirit was stirred within him. And he saw that altar, the unknown God. And he said, there's my speaking platform. And he starts right there. And says, you're overly religious. You're too superstitious. And in passing by, I saw the altar to the unknown God. And I'm going to tell you about that God. And of course, when he gets through, there's the only one God. Because that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. He doesn't need anything. He's not like a human. He created all things. That's the one that I'm going to preach to you. And the love that he has. See, that was revolutionary to them. That was something that just blew them over. Well, what do you think today? We need to keep up more with how, what ignoramuses there are out there claiming to believe in God, Christ, and the Bible that wouldn't know the Bible from a, I don't know what. But they talk like they do. All you got to do is listen to them for a while and know they don't know anything about the Bible. So the church in the first century went out there and dealt with them. Somebody would say something. I can just see somebody, Paul, say, so say to Paul, well, I don't care anything about that. He might turn around and look at them in the eye and say, and this sounds like him. He may have done it. I don't know. Well, you ought to, and if you don't, you're going to lose your soul in the devil's hell. Now, that will raise people's eyes. But we don't talk like that today. We're trying to get along too much with everybody because that's, you know, what we do in America. But yet the church in doing this kind of thing, jarring people's consciences, shaking them up, exercised a tremendous influence on the Roman Empire. As I said, they're described in Acts 17 and verse 6 as these that have come to us or those that have turned the world upside down. They were the sect, as people call them, their enemies, Everywhere spoken against, Acts 28, 22. I don't know that a great many of our brethren today would have the emotional constitution to know that they're everywhere spoken against because they're working so hard to be at peace with everybody on the wrong term. We can't be at peace with people that aren't at peace with God. You can be nice to them. You can show your Christian conduct. You can help them every way possible. But the only thing that's really going to help them is from the grips with their sins that they're separated from God. And if they died, they'd lose their soul. So really, within a very short while, they had carried the gospel to the world of that day. Paul said so by inspiration in Colossians 1 and verse 23. But now the church in our day, and I started preaching midway century of the, of the 20th century, And it's just not turning the world upside down. and hasn't been. And it's doing the same thing even worse today. The division that's among the brethren is primarily over. Not much respect for authority in general, the Lord's authority in the Bible, or how to ascertain that authority from the last will and testament of Christ. Just kind of do as you please. You know, largely the church is unknown. And many who know it are indifferent to it. They don't necessarily admire it. They may not really hate it. They just don't think it's any more than another denomination down the road. Now, why is that the case? Well, I think it's because we didn't do what the early church did that we read of in no other book but the book of Acts. It's not doing what it's what the church has always done that was faithful in the first century. Just not doing it. We quote these things. We talk about spreading the gospel. We talk about all of that. But let me show you something. How many churches do you know that are making an effort to train young men to be gospel preachers? 
Now, I don't mean that they're going to have to be able to depend upon a church for support while they give their whole time to it. I'm talking about that whether you have churches big enough to support a preacher full-time or not, that doesn't absolve us of the obligation to raise up young men to preach the gospel and to raise up young ladies to be their wives and support them in the doing the same. Why do we think that a person is a preacher who only is supported by full-time by the church, out of the church treasury, and he's known as the preacher for the certain, certain church of Christ? Where did we ever just settle on that and that excludes anybody else? Uh, it doesn't. Something wrong with that definition. You don't see that when you read your Bible. It doesn't mean that's wrong. It just means it's too limited to say those are the only people responsible for standing up for the truth and for exposing error and so forth. So why did the early church have such a tremendous influence? Well, it's attitude toward God, as I've said. They wouldn't accept one God or all the gods, and theirs were just one of them. There's only one, and I said that earlier. Only one, and you've got to love him supremely to the point of dying for him. And if you're not interested in that, you aren't ready to become a Christian. Remember the sermon this morning. There were certainly no uncertain sounds. When you read the book of Acts, you read through the New Testament. Truth is truth. It's just what it is. And the truth of the gospel is the same way. It fits the definition of truth, corresponding with reality. And they preached it, Acts 17, 24 through 31. We've already looked at Ephesians 4. That lets you know how they preached. Are there many gods? No, there's one. Are there many lords? No, there's one. Are there many bodies that are going to heaven? No, there's one. Are there many baptisms? Absolutely not. There's one. I tried that today, and you'll see that we're pretty much in the same boat today as they were. We're just not saying it. And we're not creating an atmosphere among people we know to be able to say it. So the church of the first century refused to stand in silence in the face of the view that Christ was only another Savior of some sort or the other, among all the other whatever Saviors they had. They preached that men could be saved only by Jesus Christ and His gospel. There's none of the name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now you think about that said to a bunch of Jews who just put Jesus to death because He said, I'm the Son of God. Well, that's what they said. And so on through the New Testament, especially the book of Acts, they declared that. They constantly affirmed, listen again in John 8, 24. I said, therefore, Jesus said, unto you, the Jews, therefore ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Try that on people around you today who are so much wanting to accept anything and everything. So it turned the world upside down and right side up, really, by the gospel. And there was only one gospel message, not a myriad of them. It wasn't your truth, my truth, and somebody else's truth. Take your pick. It was the truth of Jesus Christ. And they all preached the same thing. They were rebuked what error entered in among them. Remember, most of the New Testament is written to Christians. Keep them straight. So the power of God to save is the gospel. Thus, there's one faith. Ephesians 4, 6. I get amazed that people sometime over the years have come and say, of what faith are you? They wouldn't ask a question like that. They didn't believe in denominationalism. And if I answered them this way, I'm of the faith of which you read in the New Testament. They don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, but what faith is that? It's the faith that Jesus Christ set up. Well, what is that? It's the one Paul said that we're to contend for. Yeah, but which one is that? And they don't even speak as the oracles of God. They're not familiar with it, so they can't know what you're talking about. Now, they militantly rejected the view that one faith is as good as another. They contended for the true source of faith, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And they preached that one message I mentioned a while ago, Acts 8 and verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word, the very thing that got them in trouble in the first place. As they left and fled the trouble due to persecution, they preached the same thing that got them in the trouble. You know, they, they went unto the 
Jewish doctors of the law, they challenged them and they refuted their message. They went into the midst, as we studied earlier in Acts 17, the Greek philosophers. They dealt with them. That was just another bunch that needed the truth. It didn't make any difference what it was. If it was contrary to the gospel of Christ, they needed the gospel. Now, they didn't preach the spirit in the spirit of arrogance and hatefulness. Ha, ha, you're going to hell. It wasn't that. There was no self-righteousness in it. They simply affirmed the truth. It would be like saying, the scriptures teach that the baptism of the, of the Great Commission is a baptism in water to obtain the remission of sins. That's just the truth. I can snarl when I say it, or I can purr when I say it, or I can smile when I say it. The truth just stands there looking you in the face. If you don't believe that, you don't believe what the New Testament teaches in its totality on that. And that's the way we ought to preach. They had the proper disposition of mind toward the body of Christ, the church, which a lot of my brethren over all the years I've preached have dealt with the church about like most people think of the church, a denomination just kind of let us do the things that are convenient and don't bother us or anything else. Ephesians 1, and 23 says that God has put all things under the feet of Christ and thus he's the head of the church. Reconciliation to God, we studied a while back, is in that one body, Ephesians 2, 13 through 16. And it's not in any other. There is no salvation in a denomination, in any human institution. None in the Muslims or anything else that's built upon the commandments and doctrines of men. Now, let me ask you this. What would you think would happen if we spent a, a whole lot more money than Ken would more spend, and we got some big auditorium out here, and I was preaching this before a bunch of people like we had the Catholic debate and just bearing down on it. And for some reason or another, they would come out there and they're from all the background that's in this society. What do you think a lot of those people will think when I preach like I'm preaching today? See, I preach this to us. Well, we've heard it. Of course, there's a lot of churches of Christ that I'm afraid haven't heard it like they ought to. In fact, I know they haven't. But do you think that would stir up some people? Well, I know it would. It would stir them up a great deal. They would just come and hear what you said because they're not hearing it in any of the churches around about us. They need to know that the Lord purchased only one church and it cost him his blood to do it, Acts 20 and 28. 20 and 28. And then the lives of those faithful members of the church were lives of sincere consecration and dedication to Christ. As Paul said in Romans 12 and verse 1, their bodies were to be given as living sacrifices to the Lord. Their morality was clean and pure, 1 Corinthians 6. And when they went astray, they were corrected. And they knew that the greatest battle going on in the world is the battle between Christ and Satan. That means between the church and every person or group which opposes the work which Christ has given his spiritual body, the church, to do. In other words, they were willing to die rather than be unfaithful to Christ. Listen to Paul as Luke records it in Acts 21 and verse 13. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, when you live like that, you can expect what we studied about this morning. They realized they could not spare themselves, but rather they must give themselves away. That the only way they could ever really live was to die to sin and be willing to die physically rather than give up one iota of the truth of God Almighty. So we must die to the world and its influences that we might become alive to Christ. So they kept their ranks pure. They practiced corrective church discipline. They were mindful of how their members lived. And when they didn't live like the New Testament taught, the Lord gave them the wherewithal to correct them. And if they wouldn't be corrected, how to keep them from influencing other brethren. Now because it did these and other things, no doubt, the church of the first century turned the world upside down from the worldly person's perspective 
And it brought upon them the persecution we're talking about this morning. They were a militant group of people. I don't know exactly how it would be, but I think from what I've read in my Bible, I could say if you went anywhere by the end of the, or the, even the middle, but it said at least by the end of the first century, you would find these people talked about everywhere. Now, it might be that they were being talked about and things attributed to them that weren't true, but they had made an impact on the Roman world. Now, I think you'll find that the people either loved them or they hated them. There was no in-between. And when we do, like those early Christians did, as the New Testament teaches, I still say we will have a tremendous impact with the truth. But when we cruise along and try to be at peace with everybody and not upset anybody and not see people flustered and we're afraid we'll lose our job or we're afraid this, that, or the other, then we can expect things to go as they are. The world, and all the Bible describes as the world, we studied on Wednesday night, we're taught don't love the world. Any men love the world, the love of the Father's not in him. That was said to Christians of the first century. They didn't if they were faithful. But the world must learn that not only does the gospel differ completely from the doctrines of men, but that the difference really does make a difference. I'm afraid a lot of us have adopted the viewpoint of the denominations. Just be a good person, whatever you mean by that, and not stir up anything, be quiet, get along with everybody, and everything will be okay. But the world must learn the difference between truth and error. Must learn that it's the difference between going to heaven, and losing our souls, and hell. And every person who's responsible to God for his or her actions must learn that. Perhaps some well-meaning brethren will object to this type of thing, but if they do so, they have to object to it over the teaching of the Bible. Because it's there. We must make a positive approach, some will say. We must not build up prejudice by preaching any negative matters. Okay, would you be willing to put that in a propositional form and you affirm it, and then we'll go to the New Testament and take the totality of it and see if that holds up. It just won't do it. When I talk about positive, I mean positive for the truth and positively against that which is contrary to the truth. Positively teaching the truth to those who don't know it, and positively exposing the error that the truth only can expose in their lives, and calling them back to God through that truth, which is the only truth that will do the job. All you have to do is look to the prophets of the Old Testament, look to Moses, look to John the Baptist, Look to Jesus above all. Look to the apostles and the early evangelists in the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the final and complete revelation of God, the Bible, and you'll see how things ought to be. Not let our own weaknesses define what a Christian is and how they ought to act. But there's the reason that persecution came on the first century church. And there's the reason Christ, as we study this morning, said you've got to consider the cost of being a faithful disciple. These two things help fortify the person who's a Christian to get ready for whatever comes, whether it's being fed to the lions or burned at the stake or whether it's being fired from your job. Wouldn't it be something if every person that was a member of the church of Christ and I'm not using denominations here. I mean the church of Christ as we are in this congregation. If we were met by the government and said, you can't do any shopping unless you renounce your position on one God, what would you do? Can't go to H-E-B. Well, boy, you sure can't go to Walmart. I don't know what people do then. That might be a blessing to be forbidden to go to Walmart need those blinders on we talked about this morning. But see, we haven't lived in that situation, but they did in the first century. They did in the first century. 
So why was the church what it was? Well, it was vaccinated against persecution. It was coming. You serve me faithfully, you will be persecuted. Well, then what brought it on? The militant church. That brought it on. They expected it. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. As we close the lesson, I hope that we will determine to have Caleb's attitude of the Old Testament. When he had Numbers 13, 30, his attitude was, he's an old man, a lot older than I am at that point. He said, well, not at this time. He was younger at this time. Later on, he would say that concerning, give me this mountain at the end of things, when he was an old man. But his view when the spies returned was, here's what it was. Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it, Numbers 13, 30. Of course, that's with God's help, and he understood that. Whatever there is that men can do to us because we love and obey the truth, we're able to overcome it. God will see us through. Is anybody in this world more powerful than God Almighty? No. But he expects us to have the faith in that God who's that powerful based upon his word in doing our duty to him regardless of what comes our way. If you need to obey the gospel, we hope you'll do it. Start with that kind of faith and courage to show where you stand in this world by becoming a Christian such as Paul and Timothy were in obedience to the gospel. If you're a child of God, what kind of Christian are you? How strong are you? Where is your faith? Where is your zeal for the truth? Well, it's to be found in the Bible. We may need to do a lot of renewing of our faith and our repentance. If you need to repent of sins, we urge you to do so. And come now while we stand and sing.